The next topic we're going to look at is how to actually calculate the energy required to turn one substance into another. And we've done this a little bit in the past, but we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail here. So we're going to look at heat transfer with phase changes. And there's all different kinds of possibilities. But before we go into the details and before we feel too bad about the poor little rabbit there in the video, um, remember that anytime you have a solid and you you turn it into a liquid or you have a liquid that you turn into a gas that's going to be endothermic it's going to take energy to make that transformation possible on the opposite side though gases going to liquids and liquids going to solids you actually get the energy back out again and those are actually exothermic processes so down here in this kind of picture you can see there's a big solid a liquid and a gas and there's also the different terms used for these processes so as an example of that, vaporization, which we talked about earlier, is liquid going to gas, and that's going to take energy. It's going to be endothermic. On the other hand, condensation is the opposite process going from a gas to a liquid. That's going to be exothermic. But there's other terms here as well. Some of them are familiar. Some of them may not. Solids going to liquids, the process is referred to as melting. And liquids going to solids, of course, that's freezing. But there's also solids going to gas. That's the sublimation. We saw the iodine crystals turned into a gas. And then technically, deposition is the term used for going from a gas back to a solid. So if you turn the iodine crystals back into a solid iodine, that would be a deposition. Those are the terms used for the different phase changes. And uh, in Chem 221, we looked at some of these. Um, in Chem 221, I referred them to as a heat of something times a mass of something, and those are the energies to make the transitions of phases possible. We're also going to throw back into this mix the Q equals MC delta T kind of stuff that we did in Chem 221. And Q equals MC delta T is really useful when you have a temperature change, but no change in phase. So as if you had nothing else to do with your life, if any of this is looking weird, go back and look at the chapter 5 stuff of Chem 221. And you can look at it uh, if you go to the website, which is mhchem.org 221. You can check out all the chapter 5 stuff. We're going to reuse some of that stuff in this discussion. If you're going to have a change of state, so liquid to vapor or gas, you're going to need the heat of something. And a heat of vaporization is the term that's an energy required to turn a liquid into a gas. And all these heat of vaporizations are positive numbers. They're all endothermic. So if you have for water, example, the heat of vaporization is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. The temperature in parentheses is the normal boiling point that that would occur. Um, and you can see sulfur dioxide and xenon. But notice here how the value of delta H of vaporization gets larger as the intermolecular forces get larger. So xenon, which has just induced dipole, induced dipole, has the smallest heat of vaporization, and water, which is stronger than, than dipole, dipole, SO2, has the largest heat of vaporization in this list. A heat of fusion is the a term required if you take a solid and you turn it into a liquid. And again, that's another endothermic process. You can have a heat of fusion for water, SO2, xenon. The trend is the same. Uh, weaker intermolecular forces generally have lower heats of fusion and larger ones are larger. Um, pretty cool. Now, the temperature is constant during a phase change, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But you might be curious, like, how the heck do they get these heat of vaporization values? Well, two scientists named Clausius and Clapeyron came together and they figured out this kind of weird looking equation right here. And this is actually how they can calculate things like heat of fusion, all right, or heat of vaporization or heat of any of these things. <clears throat> if you plot the natural log of the vapor pressure versus one over the Kelvin temperature, you end up with a straight line. And that little graph right there shows the straight line that happens when you plot on the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. 
first of all, natural log is different than base 10 log. So on a calculator, usually there's an LN button and an LOG button. You want to make sure you use the natural log, which is LN, and not the base 10 log, which is LOG. All right. And the vapor pressure values are usually in millimeters of mercury. So you just take the natural log of your vapor pressure, put those on the Y axis. Now, all of those vapor pressures are recorded at a temperature. Usually, initially, it's in Celsius. You would turn it into a Kelvin temperature, all right, by adding 273.15 to it, and then take the inverse, which means go one over the Kelvin temperature. And if you do that, you get a nice straight line. The slope of the line is really important to chemists. All right, this is a negative slope, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in uh, one of the labs coming out, but the slope equals negative delta H divided by R. So what they're doing is they're plotting one over the temperature. So slope equals negative delta H VAP over R. And R, this is the energy R that we talked about briefly in the gas lock expression. You can actually solve for the delta H VAP value. Delta H VAP will equal the negative slope times times r, it comes out to be a value in joules per kelvin. Linear regression is the math technique that's used to get the best value for slope. And we're going to have a lab about that here pretty soon, uh, the linear regression and solids lab. But um, you can also do a cheesy version of clausius clapeyron if you only have two values using this equation right here. The P1 and P2 are the vapor pressures, and the T2 and T1 are the Kelvin temperatures that you'd use. And R is the constant, so you can solve for delta H VAP. Notice it's natural log P1 over P2, and the temperatures are 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Be careful of that. To get rid of the negative sign in the above equation, they flip the pressures around or the temperatures around. Anyway, this is maybe TMI, more information than you need, but this is literally how they get the delta H vaporization values, and it's pretty cool how they figured it out. Um, it's not something that I do every every day, that's for sure, but it is something that all of us can do if the need arises. This is an example that we looked at a little bit in Chem 221, and we're going to come back here and do this again. And this is basically a type of a curve you would see for either heating up water or cooling water, depending on which way you go. First thing you need to see is that there is a constant line right here, and that represents the part where ice is melting. So on the left-hand side, you would have solid ice. On the right-hand side, at the end of that straight line, you would have liquid water. So melting is going from a solid to a liquid, and notice that the temperature is constant. Temperature is the y-axis here. In Chem 221, we saw how the mass of something times the heat of something there was no temperature associated with it. That was just the energy to turn, for example, the solid into a liquid. So there's no temperature changes when you melt the ice. The next part, if we're going from melting to turning it into steam, is we would heat the water. And if you look here, going from this point to this point, there is a change in temperature, i.e. the y-axis value is changing. So this is heating the water, but no change in phase you have just liquid water going from the bottom circle to the top circle, all right? And this is where we use MC delta T. M is the mass of water. C would be the heat capacity of liquid water, 4.184. And delta T, final temperature minus initial temperature. So for water, that would be 100 minus 0. 100 is where we ended there at the top circle. 0 is where we started there after we first melted the ice. The next part there is a big line that goes straight across, and that's where you're turning the liquid water on the left to steam on the right. I'm going to try and use like a square here to show the difference there. The temperature is also constant, just like when we melted the ice to liquid water. When you turn liquid water to steam, you're not changing the temperature, it's still 100 degrees, but it does take energy to break apart those liquid molecules and turn them into steam. So that's the evaporation process. 
So let's put all of this in uh, kind of a practical example. Let's take 500 grams of ice at zero degrees Celsius and heat it to steam, which is gaseous water, at 100 degrees. And we're going to need some constants for this. The heat of fusion for ice, which is the energy required to melt the solid, all right, 333 joules per gram. The specific heat of liquid water, which we talked about in Chem 221, and a number I'd like you to know slash memorize, 4.184 joules per gram Kelvin. And finally, the heat of vaporization is the energy required to turn liquid water into gaseous water, 2260 joules per gram. So in this problem, we're going to take solid ice and heat it up to turn it into a liquid. And it's going to take 333 joules per gram of ice to turn the solid into a liquid. Then we're going to heat the liquid from 0 to 100 degrees. That's going to be a Q equals MC delta T problem. And finally, with our liquid at 100 degrees, we're going to turn it into gas, steam. It's going to take 2260 joules per gram of liquid water to turn it into steam. So this is going to be a three-part problem. The first problem, we're going to use the 333 joules per gram, and that's just to melt the ice. The second problem, second part of the problem, is going to be one of the Q equals MC delta T things. We're changing the temperature. We'll use that 4.184 number to figure out the energy. And then finally, step three, we'll turn the liquid water into the gas. That'll be with the 2260 number. So three parts to this problem, and we'll add up the three answers to get the overall answer to this problem. Let's go through the math. First, we're going to melt the ice, and that's where that 333 joules per gram number comes in. We have 500 grams of ice. We're going to turn it into a liquid. 333 joules is required to turn one gram of ice into liquid water. Do the math, three sig figs, 1.67 times 10 to the fifth joules to turn the 500 grams of ice to liquid water. Now, we're going to raise the water up to 100 degrees Celsius. Remember, we want to turn the ice to gas, and the only way we can do that is if we heat the water to 100 degrees. So this is a Q equals MC delta T problem. 4.184 is the heat capacity of liquid water. Still have 500 grams of, of water. And the delta T final minus initial can be Celsius or Kelvin. doesn't matter. So it's 100 degrees for delta T either way. Three sig figs, 2.09 times 10 to the fifth joules. Notice the energy required to heat the water about equal to the energy required to melt the ice. Kind of interesting. The final part here, we're going to take our liquid water at 100 degrees and turn it into a gas at 100 degrees. And that's where that 2260 number comes in. We have 500 grams of water, 2260 joules to turn one gram of liquid water into a gas, three sig figs, 1.13 times 10 to the six joules. Notice how much more energy it took to convert the liquid to a gas than it did to turn solid into a liquid or to heat the liquid water from 0 to 100. We're breaking the intermolecular forces there in step 3, and it's almost a full magnitude of energy higher than the other two processes. So the final answer then to turn the ice to vapor is going to be the sum of steps 1, 2, and 3 all put together. So if you add up 1.67 times 10 to the 5th plus 2.09 times 10 to the 5th plus 1.13 times 10 to the 6th, you get 1.51 times 10 to the 6th. We're adding things together. We have to cut this number off at the larger doubtful digit, which is right there. So that's why it's 1.51 times 10 to the 6th. If you want to divide by a thousand, turn it into kilojoules, 1,510 kilojoules to convert your ice at zero degrees Celsius to steam at a hundred degrees Celsius. And again, the interesting part, at least for this part of the problem, is that it sure took a lot more energy to turn the uh, liquid water to a gas than it did the other two steps.